November the 2nd, 26th, it's the first Wednesday in, in November, and as usual, we are having one of uh, the GoGN webinars. So for all of you, for those who join us and who don't know about the GoGN, the GoGN is the global OER graduate uh, network. It's a network of uh, PhD researchers, PhD candidates around the world who are doing their their research on an, an, an aspect of, of, of open education. So the students are at the core of, of the network, but around the students is, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big group of um, um, experts, supervisors, friends, friends of, of, of the college and people interested in, in, in research into open education. That's because that's the, very much the, 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 the objectives of, of the, the GoGN. So you could say our aim is, is threefold. We uh, want to raise the profile of research into open education. We want to support those PhD students uh, doing their research in this, in this area. And we want to develop openness as, as a process of, of, of research. Um, so this webinar is part of our first Wednesday of every month's webinars uh, where well, we, we give um, everyone an opportunity to come and talk about their, their, their research or something they are interested in. So whether it is students or whether it is, um, you know, somebody who's, who's already uh, have, who already has a PhD but would like to share the research, so everybody is very welcome to to give one of these uh, webinars and today we're very lucky and um, um, yeah you know this and uh, I think we're very lucky but both well to have both Suzanne and 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 Maha with us talking about this self um, as an open educational resource um, um, the seminar is being recorded and it will be sorry the webinar is being recorded and it, it will be available as soon as possible after the event on the GoGN's uh, YouTube um, channel um, and it will be available under the Creative Commons license. Uh, you can tweet using the self OER hashtag and um, Suzanne and Maha want to want to make this very interactive so please feel free to use the the chats um, you know as, as often as, as you want to to, to ask questions. Um, Suzanne and and Maha will introduce them in a little while so I think I'm not gonna say anymore for the time being and I'm gonna basically hand over to, to them. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Bea. So I think um, I'll, I'll start the presentation. And we kind of divided the presentation into three major sections, well, uh, quite informally. So the first section is about an overview of our work and what we did previously and the whole film. I guess it's, it's like the conceptual framework. And I'll talk about sharing openly. And then um, in the third section, Maha will talk about openness as a worldview. And um, we have a lot of questions for you. Um, so hopefully, this will be very interactive and you'll be joining the conversation. Um, so we'll have more discussions, more conversations, maybe in the second half of the, um, of the talk, of the presentation. So um, first of all, um, thank you so much for, oops, um, Okay, thank you so much for joining um, our presentation. Um, the slides are switching, um, so okay, we're on slide one. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you so much for uh, joining CELF as an open education resource. Uh, my name is Suzanne and Maha, I'm presenting this with my colleague Maha. Um, so we'll introduce ourselves a little more in depth uh, in the upcoming slides. So um, if you are watching this event, um, if you're watching the presentation afterwards, um, feel free to join the conversation. You hashtag self OER. Um, so a day, a week, a year, it really doesn't matter. We would love to hear from you. OK, so um, this, I mean, the PowerPoint, I guess, the presentation side of things, um, it's, it builds upon our OER 16 presentation. Um, so we presented our work at, um, in Edinburgh um, in, in spring, um, which was really exciting and we got really good 
feedback. Um, we also have an article, so perhaps you know you might enjoy reading that. Um, so um, we have the link for you. We can also tweet the link for you um, so that you can easily you know find the article. And the the slides are not exactly the same, so they are repurposed for a grad you know um, student audience. Hopefully, you find this useful, relevant for what you're doing. Okay, so basically, um, again, you know, we are, you know, Susan Maha. <laughs> We're very, very much interested in education, open education. And um, I work as an academic developer at Goldsmiths, University of London. And also, I uh, this semester, I'm working as an adjunct faculty um, at the University of Minnesota. So um, I did my PhD in learning technologies at the University of Minnesota. I defended in 2016, so uh, quite recent. And um, I started tweeting, I think it was actually 2014, not 2015. So it started tweeting and blogging towards the end of my PhD. And that was mostly for my dissertation. And um, tweeting, being on Twitter particularly, changed the way I look at research, changed the way I actually changed everything for me because that's how I found my focus. And that's how I met, you know, incredible people like Gardner Campbell and, you know, lots of other people. I just can't you know, start counting names, I guess. But it was um, quite a transformative experience for me. And we'll talk about that, you know, later. So I'll just let Maha introduce herself um, very quickly. So uh, I am uh, an associate professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching here at the University of Cairo. And so my work is like Suzanne's in terms of supporting teachers with their teaching. I mean, academic development is, sounds like similar to what I do, what we call here faculty development in the American system. Um, and I've been doing this since 2003. Uh, I started doing it, did my master's online, did my PhD in education University of Sheffield. And I knew about blogging way back in 2003. Uh, I knew about it. I gave workshops on it. I encouraged faculty to use it with their classes. and But I myself didn't start blogging to, until 2013. And people look at me and how often I write right now. I write, I blog at least three or four times a week, and I write in different places, and I tweet a lot. And they don't imagine probably that throughout my PhD, I didn't blog at all. I wasn't confident enough to blog. Um, I didn't think that I would have time to blog. Now that I do, I realized that my blogging is helping me write peer-reviewed papers and it's helping me get known and helping me do all sorts of other things. But at the time when I was doing my PhD, I didn't realize it. And I really, really respect people who do blog through their PhD. And so a lot of the things I'm going to talk about when I get into openness as an attitude are things that I developed after I finished my PhD and became more confident. And I really respect the people who are doing it early on in their careers. I started tweeting and publishing some articles in open magazines before I finished my PhD. And the tweeting especially helped me find other graduate students who were in the same stage of their PhD about to get into their Viva. And it helped me a lot. I couldn't have gotten through and finished my PhD because I had no local support. I lived here in Egypt. It was a politically hard time. Most of my friends, I work at a university, but I was on maternity leave. And most people here had their PhD from the US, which is a very different thesis defense process. You know, in, in the UK, I, I actually went into my thesis defense without my supervisor even in the room with just my two ex my external and my internal examiner. And so that is not something that a lot of people here in Egypt have an experience of. And so the online, uh, the tweeting helped me a lot with that kind of thing. It helped me prepare. Uh, you know, some people said, don't worry too much about annotating your thesis and, and focus on blah, 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 and it helped a lot. And so but that's my blog, if you're ever interested in taking a look at it, if you haven't seen it before. And I'll leave Suzanne the floor for a few minutes until it's my turn again. OK, well, thanks, Maha. <laughs> so um, OK, so moving to open education. OK. OK, so I won't go too much into detail about, you know, what OER OERs can be what they are. Um, this image is by the Open Education Consortium, and you can see how wide the scope of open education is. You know, um, when you look at this image, you see everything from you know open licenses to open content, um, open um, repositories, research. So it's a, the scope of open education is obviously very very broad, and people do quite a, you know lots of different things on open education. Um, but I guess when we look at what it means for people, I mean, 
the mainstream understanding of open education is mostly about resources, open education, you know, um, so you can think about, you know, videos, um, podcasts, PDFs, books, their materials, right? Um, so the focus is mostly on things, on not on actions, on content, um, and so on materials. And these are, um, generally speaking, they're, you know, planned, they're quite refined, and, um, you know, they're, they're organized. Um, uh, they, they have an instructional format. So, um, and if I go back to the previous slide, um, if you look at the bottom of the image here, um, you can see, I guess, um, perhaps we can talk about the values in open education. So, um, you know, what does it enable? And here we have access, opportunity, and equity. And I guess we also need to question those, and perhaps we can talk about those um, during the discussions. So, anyways, um, so again, what are open education resources? I mean, just very generally speaking, their content, they're mostly about content. But here, you know, in our work, we want to highlight that, you know, open education can be much more than that. Um, so our focus is on sharing, you know, open culture, open education practices, networks. And, um, and the rationale for that is that education is not all about content. And if we think about education as all content, we're reducing the value of education, right? It's also about people, about networks. And um, we really like this quote by um, George Siemens and Amir. Um, the true benefit of the academy is the interaction between people, the access to the deba debate, and the access to the negotiation of knowledge. So um, in our presentation in Edinburgh, you know, we propose that the processes and products of open scholarship can also be valuable open education resources. Anyone can be an open education resource. We can be an education resource. So we'll talk about ourselves and what it means, you know, um, in terms of um, what openness might mean, you know, if you position yourself as an open education resource. So I'll um, ground my discussion um, in my dissertation research. So I'll talk about my research a little bit. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so I'm going to talk about the participants a little bit, the tensions I experienced in my research, and also the ethics of using open data. So I did my dissertation study on uh, thought vectors, uh, concept space. This was the MOOC designed by um, the Virginia Commonwealth University. And this was offered as a three credit um, course um, for all VCU students. Um, a course on research inquiry, and it was also um, open to public. So anyone could join the course, and people do, did lots of exciting things. They were blogging, tweeting, so it was uh, it was a really interesting format. If you're interested in open education, please take a look at their course. It's just so inspiring, and the whole structure of it was quite amazing. There were six sections, six instructors, I mean, 120 so um, VCU students plus open participants plus faculty and staff, they were all blogging. So again, the structure was really, really uh, interesting. It was quite you know, complex. So um, these are my research participants. And, um, you know, I, I did a qualitative study and this was an interpretive case study. And I found that the process was so different than doing a quantitative study um, because my research participants were so much more than, you know, research, you know, the data, you know, research data. They were people and I really spent so much time trying to understand these people. And I realized that it's so difficult to understand people, right? You think you understand somebody, but, you know, it's so difficult. I think people were so complex. And when you get, get into this, when you're doing research, um, I was overwhelmed, to be honest. Um, I was so overwhelmed. And it was a very rewarding process. So uh, from left to right, um, this is, um, oh, I'm blanking on names now. <laughs> uh, Melanie, um, Mariana, um, Carol, and here in the middle, I have Michael, and today I'll, I'll talk about Michael. He's the focus of my talk today. So Michael is not his real name. So I approached all my research participants. These are all open participants, okay? Um, 
please let me know if you get confused by the way because you know because i have everything in my mind I sometimes get confused and i'm quite this is kind of a monologue i'm talking to myself here so please feel free to chime in and ask me questions um so anyway so i did interviews with these people um i examined their blog posts examined their tweets and i had lots of chats um with michael you know i i contacted all of these people and except michael everyone was really open to communication and they really helped me with my research with michael he never responded to my request to you know have an interview with him he never contacted me on twitter i left comments on his blog he never responded to me but he was still active so he was kind of ignoring me and i didn't know what to do um so that was a challenge michael was ignoring me the others were not and the irb i received for my research actually allowed me to examine michael's um, data examine you know uh, i was um, it was okay for me to from the university's perspective examine michael's publicly available blog posts and tweets so i did that um, and um, because his participation was really interesting and he was posi positioning himself as a learning resource for teachers and his, in his posts um, this was sometimes quite explicit. So you would say things like, you know, um, I'm posting this resource, my, I'm posting this as a learning resource for all middle school teachers, something like that. Okay. Um, so I found in my research that all these open participants, they had really diverse roles in this uh, MOOC. Uh, they positioned themselves as, you know, um, Carol was saying that she wanted to be seen as an embedded librarian. Um, Mariana, she was a network provocateur. So all of these people had really diverse roles. And Michael was you know, positioning himself as a learning resource. So again, I mean, going back to the IRB process, I went through the IRB process for my research. So I went through the, um, you know, my research was approved by the institutional board um, at the University of Minnesota. Um, but when it came to Michael, I was quite confused because, you know, I could allow, I could examine his blog post. I did that at the end, um, but I, I quickly, no, not quickly, in time, you know, I realized that I wasn't in his intended audience. So I guess we can talk about, you know, here an imagined audience and also the real, the authentic audience and the tension between those two. Um, so from an institutional perspective, um, because Michael was blogging publicly and because he was tweeting publicly, um, you know, there was no, there was no harm in examining his data uh, because it was data, to be honest. I mean, it, um, it was publicly available data. Um, but then when I think about myself and how I blog, I came to realize that now, you know, when I look back, um, it was also his personal space, wasn't it? I mean, it was public, but at the same time, it was quite a personal space. And um, so I experienced the tension between my personal values. You know, I, I maybe I should have, I shouldn't have uh, researched Michael's blog that way. Maybe I should have received informed consent. Um, and then we have these institutional values, you know, the IRP process and everything, ensuring that the research is met to, you know, it's up to a high standard and you're not harming participants and so on. So that was a tension I experienced. So at the end, what I did was I took some, you know, um, strong measures to protect Michael's privacy. Um, so now if you look at, you look at my dissertation, <laughs> if you know, you know, Michael, you, somebody might find out who Michael is. But you have to work really hard to do that. Um, I changed all the codes by Michael. Uh, so if somebody Googles them, they won't be able to find them. Um, his tags, I changed the tags I use. I created a word cloud using um, blog post tags. I changed his tags. And so I edited the data quite a bit. I modified the data. And um, I was quite transparent about my approach um, to my committee. So my committee knew all about this. And I think I have a section on that in my dissertation. Um, so I talk about that in my dissertation too. So, um, so yes, so that was, I thought, you know, um, it's still, I'm still confused about that. So maybe I'll write about that at some point. Um, but the whole idea of, you know, just because something is public, it doesn't mean that, you know, um, it's in reality, it's quite personal as well, right? So 
public personnel is just, you know, um, such a mix now. So um, just trying to get through the next slide here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I guess, yeah, so I, that's what I wanted to share with me, with you in this presentation. Um, so um, when I was doing all of this, I was also blogging. So I blogged part of my dissertation. Um, I blogged about you know, my findings. So everything was really transparent to, um, you know, the course conveners, the um, instructors, and also um, I was tweeting. And <laughs> that was really useful for me to go forward. Um, but I wasn't strategic in any way. And Maha will talk about um, Laura Gogia. Uh, and she was um, much more strategic. And I think she, um, she used blogs really well in her dissertation. So you can use blogs and tweeting uh, in a very creative way. And you can, you know, you, they can be part of your dissertation a lot more. Um, with some, you know, more thinking maybe. So anyway, so I talked about creating openly, and now Maha will talk about openness as a worldview, and we also have uh, some discussions. Um, at this point, if you have any questions, I'm, you know, I will be um, really interested in hearing your questions. There was a quick question by uh, Janesh, and if you just scroll up on the on the uh, chat, uh, Janesh was asking, did you share your results with Michael and get his thoughts on your interpretation? Uh, Hang on, I think you're still muted. Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just saying, no, I wasn't able to do that. There was no uh, communication between uh, me and Michael. Does anybody else have any questions for Suzanne? Okay, if you think of anything else, you can uh, ask her. I think someone's typing. Okay, I'll wait. Because I think Jenny or Hafira is. Why, why did you choose him then? That's a good question Hafira is asking. Why did I choose him? Because I think, um, so I looked into everyone's blog post and his blog post was really interesting. It was just, you know, I was personally curious about it. It was um, um, the way he posted things um, inspired me to do some of, you know, some inspired me to look into them, uh, some research. So it was interesting to um, have his, um, you know, perspective, have his blog post in my, in my study. Um, so just to be clear, Michael, um, so the participants, so um, no, so Michael wasn't really, I, I'm not sure if I call Michael a participant, I guess he was a participant. So I examined everyone's blog posts and um, Twitter feeds, but then I also interviewed um, four other people. So I received informed consent for those four people and not for Michael, because the IRB, um, allowed me to examine his blog post um, without receiving informed consent um, because it was, you know, um, framed as data. Okay. If anybody asks any other questions, I think uh, we could respond to them later. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on from that and talk about what's it like to be open. I mean, right now there's the Open Education Conference and there's a call for the Open Educational Res Resources Conference, OER 17. And a lot of times when we talk about open, we talk about the products of openness. You know, you produce an open access article or you produce an open educational resource. But like, uh, like Suzanne was talking about earlier, we're focusing on practices and, and connections and, and so on. So I'm thinking of openness as a state of being in the world, not just creating things, but of being open. And what does that mean? And we looked at some of the things that different people we know of have been doing. So Kevin Hodgson, who is a teacher in the US, um, he once introduced himself as an editable person. And it's not about openness as in putting your ideas out there in the sense that a lot of people would consider open practice, but open in the sense of being open to change, 
of editing yourself and mod and evolving as a person. And and when when the, when Kevin writes that, you sort of feel like, oh, this means that if you know if I disagree with you, maybe we can actually have a conversation, and you might change your mind, or you might evolve in the process of you know as we get to know each other. So I thought that was an interesting way of looking at openness. Um, the other thing is, you know, you don't want to be just about open as in broadcasting, but also to reevaluating your worldview sometimes when people different from you, you know, critique it. And Jesse Stommel is one of the people that I work with a lot, and sometimes, occasionally, he will do something, and he, you will see Twitter conversations between him and other people who didn't like what he did or who disagree with what he did, and the way he engages them, I think, is very open. Uh, so he'll engage with people who are much less known than himself, but li really listen to them, and I think that's important. So I have just questions for you. We asked earlier if you were blogging or do do tweet a lot and blog sometimes, so we already have that result. Um, but I was wondering how many of that is dissertation? How many of you tweet or blog about things related to your dissertation? Let's just write a little bit about that. And even if you do that, um, I'm also wondering if you're tweeting or blogging, well, tweeting obviously not, but blogging, for example, are you blogging messy on certain thoughts or are you blogging like nearly complete things that are almost going to go into your actual thesis or your literature review? Nice, Jenny writes messy stuff. Vulnerable grad student. Very nice, Lisa. Okay, and Debbie, my brand new is just starting a journey. Great, that's really good to hear. <laughs> and Bea is saying she can't blog messy. And I've seen a lot of people who don't blog messy. I think someone like Catherine Cronin, Kate Bowles, uh, if you guys know them, they don't blog messy. They blog very, really good stuff. It's useful as a resource, uh, but it's not, it doesn't mean that they're confused, really. It tells me where they're at right now. Uh, and I look up to them, too, but... Um, yeah, sometimes the other part is interesting to see. So what I'm seeing from, okay, so you're working full-time while doing a PhD. Okay. Um, yeah, because I think if someone blogs like, oh, hi, Catherine, we were just talking about you. <laughs> I was just talking about how you're uh, <laughs> the kind of person who blogs um, stuff that, you know, complete thoughts. Uh, that are really well organized rather than vulnerable, messy thoughts. And I wonder if that's how you see yourself, but that's the way you look to me. Like, I think of you to Kate Bowles, maybe also Audrey Waters. These are people who really, I feel like they really thought out what they were going to write before they published it, as opposed to someone like me, I just blog whatever sometimes. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask you is whether you're blogging uh, more about the content of your PhD study or the process as of your own learning and narrating it. So Debbie, you're full-time and online, part-time. Well, you said full-time and online, and then you said PT, which I assume means part-time, so I'm a little bit confused. Or you mean you work full-time and your PhD is part-time. That's probably what you mean, right? Okay. I was, I was that person. I was working full-time and my PhD was part-time, but I wasn't blogging at the time. That's a good point, Catherine. So Catherine's saying that she uses Twitter for more live narrative thinking. And I think people like Bonnie Stewart is also like that. I think she uses Twitter for thinking and blogging. Her blogging is a little bit more organized as well. Uh, and Lisa's saying she'd like to read blogs from early researchers if you can, if you can recommend. Academic blogs are somewhat intimidating. That's I agree. Um, I think, so that's a good question, Lisa. When I was finalizing my PhD, I found some hashtags, and I'm going to post those in here. There's a PhD forum, oops, a SOC PhD. I, I mean, my PhD was in education, so it depends on what the topic was. And then there's, these hashtags are sometimes used by PhD students, and I was using them a lot when I was uh, finalizing my PhD, and they all had people like me. I don't know if they were blogging necessarily, because I was more tweeting with them. I might have been at that point very new to Twitter, so I wasn't really focusing on whether the person I'm reading is someone who's is the same person who tweeted the article. You know what I mean? Before you get to know people, that isn't as important of an issue. Right now, I really figure out, you know, is are you tweeting your own article or someone else's? But these were all hashtags that helped me, and some of them are connected to websites. So I have an article on the SOC PhD website, which I can't remember what it is right now. But I was talking about my experience as a part-time PhD student and how I tried to make my part-time PhD experience approximate 
the full-time on-site experience, for example. Uh, which is actually a funny thing because I'm going to talk to you about, um, about virtually connecting, which is the way I do that with conferences, try to make myself be at a conference even though I'm not actually there. So, so this is interesting. Now I'm seeing people talking about their PhD and their research and, and whether it's an EDD or a PhD. Okay. Yeah, I get what you mean about being on the margins though. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that future of education hashtag with Kathy Davidson. I can't remember what it was. Probably future ed. That's probably what it was. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Now I'm going to talk about the practices. I might, do I have more? Wait, I feel like I've skipped something. Hang on. Okay, more questions. Uh, and these are, you can just, you know, answer these questions as we go. Yeah, Thesis Whisperer is great. I agree, Debbie. Um, there's also some people that I discovered from the Guardian Higher Education and Times Higher Education Supplement. Um, I discovered some people through there. Uh, there's some people who are either academics who are willing to help and people who are not, but who, are, who might be uh, graduate students of themselves. And there was something called, there's a podcast called Viva Survivors. I don't know if anybody's heard of this one, but that's really useful. So there are people telling the story of their Viva, and that's really helpful. Um, okay, and so the other questions I have for you is, are you blogging questions or answers? So when you go on your blog, one of the best, one of the earliest lessons I learned about social media is that you learn a lot from asking questions rather than just saying what you've discovered. Because when you ask a question, then a lot of people either will know that they have this, you have the same question that they have and they benefit from that, or they might have answers or they might have some resources to point you to and it's very helpful all around. Um, and you also learn to ask good questions. And on Twitter, you learn to ask concise questions, which is actually really helpful. Uh, you know, how do you question uh, in a very brief way and concise way that it will be understood without people knowing your context? Also very important. And then knowing when to use a hashtag so that people will understand your context a little bit. So. And the other thing I was thinking about is, are you building your PLN? There was someone... Um, blogging today about how someone who's an adjunct, it's very difficult to tell someone who's an adjunct to then put their course materials to be openly with a Creative Commons license. And I was recently writing also about the privilege of Creative Commons licensing is that someone like Doug Belshaw writes CC, has his thesis as CC0, and that comes such a position of privilege that he's not worried about being of this being stolen from him and and you know taken over by someone else pretending that they created it. But that kind of thing happens to people. It happens to real people, and people lose their entire thesis by someone stealing it and publishing it under their own name. So it's really important that. But the reason I think someone like Doug Belshaw can do it is he's well known enough, and he probably has a pretty strong PLN. But someone who doesn't have a PLN cannot be that, feel that safe and trust people with their things. And so telling an adjunct professor who does not have a PLN that, oh, by the way, if you put your stuff openly, people will recognize you for it. That, that's not, if he doesn't already know people, that's a very difficult thing to ask. Uh, I mean, you, you know, I was talking to Alan Levine, so someone who's not affiliated right now, but who's very well known otherwise and who was affiliated before. And he says, I don't worry because this gets me more work and it gets me recognized. Yeah, because people already know you, right? But if people, if you're obscure and nobody knows you at all, that isn't usually uh, what happens. Yes, so I'm seeing people's comments. I'm just not commenting on them, but thank you. Yes. Um, and then, are you allowing others to influence your thinking? And that doesn't need to happen online, right? This can happen in a face-to-face -face situation where, especially when you interact with people from different disciplines, where their discourse is already quite different than yours, it takes a lot of effort to listen and to see how that might influence the way you think. Uh, I've benefited a lot from that because I didn't have a lot of people with an education background, so I had to learn from people in sociology and language teaching and all those different fields uh, just because that's who I had to interact with in my face-to-face -face context. And Debbie, yes, I agree. You do need to have a leap of faith to have confidence to post stuff. So, I mean, even, even being it and assuming that people will will want to read it or will want to share it is in itself a kind of confidence or even arrogance. And it's also a kind of humility because you're putting yourself at risk, right? I mean, just today, um, I co-authored a piece with Autumn Keynes and uh, Lise Calor-Bissette about digital literacies in Prof Hacker. 
and I can actually put the link right here. I can plug up. It's a critique of um, a strategic brief that was posted in um, by the New Media Consortium about digital literacies. Uh, I don't know if some of you have seen that, but, but the people, the New Media Consortium is a really big organization, is a very influential organization. The first author of the piece is a very influential person who is a friend. But we had critiques of it. And the, you know, to respond quickly, whatever critiques we have may not be as well written as they could have been. We tried to write them constructively and put them openly and to publish them. But, you know, it's still a risk that we take by doing that. Uh, instead of like writing a peer reviewed article that goes through uh, a lot of people giving us feedback on it, we just went ahead and published that. So you take risks. And of course, people like Audrey Waters, who critiques the ed tech field. Uh, she gets harassed and things like that, especially women and minorities. And we'll talk about this in a second. So um, I'm going to run to Laura and and uh, Bonnie. And Laura and Bonnie are presenting at Open Ed this conference. Like I think it's on Friday that they're presenting about this open thesis, right? Because they weren't just they were publishing about their process, about how they were doing their research, about some of the things that were confusing them, uh, about they're publishing a sort of like also status updates of where they were going. Laura sometimes would publish visualizations of where she thinks her thesis is going and what she thinks she's finding. And she has a recent blog post. And I think if these slides are going to be made available, people can look at the blog post uh, where she's again talking about the spec, not a spectrum. I think she was talking about it more uh, as more than a spectrum of ways to open with your thesis. So Laura, for her thesis, uh, she had people live tweet her thesis defense. And again, this is in the US where you can do that. And Bonnie um, had um, had her her thesis defense um, live streamed. Uh, sorry, so for for Laura it was live tweeted, and for Bonnie it was live streamed the video. You could watch it, but that's not the only way to be open. You're open if you blog about it. There are different stages of being open um, uh, with their thesis, and so they, they were talking about those different things. So yeah, here it is. That's what that's what L Laura was talking about. And so you could consider whether any of those things. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> um, that that there's those different ways that you can decide to make your your things more open or not. So Javier is saying that sometimes she sees exaggerated overconfidence in influential bloggers who don't create academic research. That's a very good point. Uh, there's a there's a lot of people who do both, but there are people who don't do both. Um, and there are some influential bloggers who are not academics, so they have no need to publish their research that way. Um, but then someone like Mike Caulfield, and I'm not sure if he considers himself an academic, but Mike Caulfield talks about how the field, yeah, I'll give you a, uh, yeah, I'll just finish this point and I'll give you the, the mic, uh, Suzanne. Is that Mike Caulfield talks about how the field of ethics moves so fast that you need to blog now or the moment will have passed, and by the research it gets published, it's old. And, and given how much time it takes sometimes to get some of this published, it really does become old. I, I remember there was this one article of ours that took a little bit more than a year to get published. There was an article I wrote about MOOCs that took six months to get published, by which time I had changed my mind. Not only had MOOCs moved on from that, I had changed my mind. And it, this every time someone reads that article, I'm like, no, no, don't read that article. I have better stuff now. <laughs> anyway. So, Yeah, just related to that, I just wanted to say that blogging also changed the way I look at academic research. So before blogging, tweeting, I was reading like, you know, seminal people in my field in learning technologies, reading, you know, lots and lots of journal articles. But now, um, I think with blogging, I find my voice, to be honest, and that, that is reflected in the final part of my discussion, maybe not in the beginning. But I think it's, it was a process for me. And now when I'm reading academic articles, sometimes I'm just questioning the language so much. I'm like, get to the point. You know, what do you want to say? So I think blogging is also helpful to, you know, bridge the gap within that, you know, academic writing and, you know, just, uh, just writing. It's, it's all about communication. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, one of the very key things about being a public academic is to get your point across, not just to make it public. So accessibility is not just that I can click it and open it on my on my browser. It's about my being able to actually read it and understand it. And those of us who blog learn to write in this way. 
Uh, the problem with academic writing for a thesis is usually they ask you not to write that way. And I'm, I'm surprised that I survived that and can still write more accessibly. Um, but I do remember that as soon as I'd finished my PhD, it was difficult for me to write in an accessible way. And I learned to go back to my own personal voice and to lose that extra academic stuff that was really unneeded. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an important thing, I think, to, to strive to have that voice that can benefit people beyond those niche people who really understand what you're saying. And so, so I know, for example, that what I'm accessible to a wider academic audience, but my friends who aren't academics don't understand anything I write that isn't about parenting, maybe. Uh, and that's sort of okay because it, not all of it is supposed to address them. So it's important, important to keep, um, you know, to think of who your audience is for each of the different things you write and where you choose to write them. Um, but also, you know, which, part, which parts of what we write is supposed to be a conversation and with whom. And so it has to be accessible to whoever the conversation is addressing and hoping to. I made you giggle. <laughs> yes, I changed my mind by the time it got published. Like, we change our minds. I feel so bad for some um, academics write a book that's very, very famous. And then they write the follow-up book, and nobody reads the second book. But the second book is where they're thinking what they're thinking about now. Like, if you're thinking, someone like Edward Said, who wrote about Orientalism, and that was his first idea about it, and everyone talks about an Orientalism, but he has books after that where he felt people misunderstood part of what he said, and he's trying to change it. Uh, Paulo Freire has Pedagogy of Hope, he has Pedagogy of I don't know what else. All of these came after Pedagogy of the Oppressed, but people are still stuck on Pedagogy of the Oppressed. That's not the only thing he's ever written, you know? Um, but anyway, with blogging, at least you can, you know, if you change your mind, you can blog it right away. You don't have to wait, you know, until the publisher gets it out. <laughs> uh, oh, I like the slightly whispering voice. I'm a very loud voice and I need to work on uh, temper, you know, getting it a little, little bit lower. Um, so this is a question about conference participation and I don't know how many of you know about virtually connecting. Uh, but how often do you go to conferences? Like how many times per year? I'll, I'll also participate like when I was doing my PhD. tell you a funny story. Because I was a remote student, um, during my PhD I lived part of it in Cairo, part of it in Houston in the US, and part of it in Norwich in the UK. And when I was in Norwich in the UK, my PhD supervisor in Sheffield completely forgot that I was in England. And there was a free full-day event for graduate students to present their work and to share ideas, and he was organizing it, and he forgot to tell me. I was like, how could you do that to me? <laughs> um, but what I did do is I just kept track of, of different things that were happening at Sheffield. And so that whenever I went, I tried to go to something else that was going on there. And if there was a conference nearby, like in Sheffield Hallam or uh, somewhere like Lancashire or Liverpool, somewhere that wasn't too far away, I would just go that same week. Um, and yeah, so the other question is, so most of you guys get to go to between two and four conferences a year, right? And usually you have to be presenting, which is very daunting because when you're a PhD student, you're not necessarily yet confident. It's good to be confident to present, but it's also difficult to get accepted in the first instance. Oh, good. So Debbie also know about virtually connecting. That's good. So um, the other thing is, yeah, going up, do you, when you go to a conference, how confident are you to go up to a keynote speaker? And this question is not for Catherine because she herself is this, keynote speaker, which to me is always amazing. People like Catherine Cronin and Bonnie Stewart, uh, and to, to a lesser extent, but also someone like Laura Gogi, were people known in their field while they were still doing their PhD. They didn't wait until they finished their PhD to, to get there. Um, but then, but generally, you know, people who are not Catherine Cronin, how confident are you to just go up and talk to people? Okay, so Jenny, because you've been a practitioner for, uh, for a long time, okay. Because I was at the uh, the ALT conference, uh, you know, that, when was it, a year and a half ago where I met Catherine and Suzanne in person. And I remember that you would see people, the, the key, you know, people who are keynote speakers or previously keynote speakers like Catherine Cronin and Jonathan Wirth, and nobody was walking up to them. And I was like, they're right there. They're not doing anything. And you're just like, 
leaving them to their own private thoughts. And it's, it might be that people in England are just uh, polite. It's not maybe they're not shy, but it's still like nobody, like no one at all. And at some point I was passing by Steve Wheeler and Jonathan Worth and I'd spoken to them before, but I hadn't seen them both together. And I stopped for a selfie and then I felt kind of vulgar because nobody else was doing that. <laughs> But anyway, uh, they are too English. Yeah, you think? Yeah, but you're Spanish. You would, you would be more. Uh, you would feel differently. <laughs> yeah, and some people, I guess, are more approachable than others. But some people, you don't know they're approachable until until you start talking to them. So someone like George Siemens uh, doesn't seem very approachable to me, uh, and I haven't met him in person. But when I have interacted with him, he's very approachable. He'll talk to. He just talks to you. I mean, he's he doesn't have problems. Just some people are, yeah, more easily approachable that way. Um, so I'm just going to move on to virtually connecting, which I, I think I think of in itself. So I, I know that a couple of you know what virtually connecting is. Um, I'll explain very quickly what it is in case some people don't know. But basically what we do is that if you can't be at a conference, yes, we have a great program for open ed. Uh, if you can't be at a conference, we have people on site who are volunteers who will connect you virtually to, to have a conversation with people at the conference. So we don't care what's happening in the sessions. The sessions can be closed or whatever, or open, whatever the conference organizers want. Uh, but if you want to have a conversation with people, whether they're keynote speakers or anyone else, we try to invite as many people as we think people will be interested in and to have as many sessions as we can. And this picture over here is uh, myself and Rebecca at Alt. This is Martin Weller and Martin Hoxie. Uh, and they were the guests and we were the on-site buddies connecting them the phone. That Rebecca's holding is where everybody virtually was joining us. I love that photo too. The lighting is amazing. Um, so the idea of it, I think, is that a lot, and, and I hear it more from people who are newer to the field than me, uh, is that they they get this opportunity to talk to someone and they see them unplugged, right? They don't see their polished self, they see their open, social, uh, informal self and this and they can ask them questions in ways that even when you're on site at a conference you don't get to spend half an hour or 45 minutes with the keynote speaker usually so this gives people that, that opportunity and uh, and we've we're thinking about that whether that's an open practice uh, open practice in the sense of what virtually connecting does but also open practice in the sense of the guests themselves taking their time to have that casual conversation we think is a form of openness as a state of being, you know, just being open in that way of, you know, get to know, getting to know each other. Like a virtual coffee break, yes. So we call them hallway conversations. Uh, some people refer to, to like going for a drink or whatever, but yeah, like a coffee break with them. And, and often it is during a coffee break, right? Uh, so that we don't take up times from sessions. But I think we had a session with Catherine Cronin that time that went, it started at the end of lunchtime, but the conversation was so good that we just kept going into the next session. <laughs> so that happens sometimes. Yeah, and I think, yes, I think virtual participants often do feel like they belong, that they are that they belong on that table where they are not able to be physically at that table. Um, but just going back to uh, taking a critical look into open, and this is something people like Catherine Crone have written about and Sava Singh have written about and spoken about, and whose voices dominate open. And I think about myself as someone who's technically on the margins because I'm here in Egypt and I'm an early career person. But my voice is so loud that it sort of would drown out the voices of other researchers from my region because they're just not as loud or not as open. Uh, and what about other people who are in a more vulnerable situation? And can they be open? And what can they be open about? Um, just yesterday, someone was asking me if I had any censorship on the kinds of things I publish on an Arab pirate magazine. And I said, I don't talk about politics. So there's no reason for someone to censor me. But that's actually an intentional choice that I don't write about politics. I do have views about politics. I just don't write about them because I could get into real trouble for it. Uh, and I, that's not where I want, that's not where my activism needs to be, you know. But it's, it's, it's one of those things to realize that there might be certain things that either someone is open or someone chooses not to be open because of the vulnerability. Um, the open minority voice that becomes dominant, that's what I was talking about earlier, and then is that a responsibility or a burden? Is it inevitable? There's, I think I'm going to talk next about some people who are in those vulnerable situations who still write, and so I respect those people a lot. Um, but then one more thing is to think about that a lot of open educational resources and a lot of openness is in English. It's by the Western um, scholars. And so that again sort of 
it makes someone like me exotic and get noticed a lot because I'm other. Um, but it, it's an all, it's also a thing to keep in mind that, you know, a lot of the people who can afford to be open are from the West and they're Anglo, they're full time, um, wherever they are, not uh, marginal, they're not precarious. And, and that means that there are voices that dominate, that are already dominant in other ways, and that openness reproduces that dominance, you know, it's, it's another privilege that gets reproduced on its all the way through. Um, and so here are some people who, who risked vulnerability, right? So Audrey Waters risks vulnerability by being one of the few women critiquing EdTech. I know we're almost out of time, but I'm just going to keep going. Uh, there are people like Kat, uh, Kate Bowles and Rebecca Hogue who write about illness. And one of the things Rebecca Hogue tells me, and Rebecca is the co-founder of Virtually Connecting too, by the way, and she talks about how writing about cancer means she's less likely to get a job because people are afraid to hire people who have cancer. And I don't know if this is a statistic, but I can sort of understand that. Uh, because, you know, when you've had it and you're post-treatment, you're never really fully 100% healthy. You're just not, you know, just don't have cancer right now. But it's always like there's a lot of after effects and all that. And and she's currently a PhD student and she doesn't have a full-time job. She's a consultant in different places and she teaches adjunct in different places. So it's a lot. It's a lot of courage to do what she does. Uh, and to share all of that, and that it helps a lot of people, but she's also exposing herself. Uh, Rusul Rabil, who is the, um, the headscarf woman over there, she uh, she was um, she was in a sort of precarious position in Canadian higher education, and she blogged about that, and it was a very thing to do because she called them out on a lot of injustice that they were doing to precarious labor. So I really respect these women for what they do. And so thinking about openness as a process dimensional it's shifting it's evolving it's contextual you know what it means to be open in a certain space it's influenced by our digital literacies if you don't have the digital literacies to be open digitally then then it's very difficult for you to achieve that and of course there are ways to be open non-digitally but the digital is more visible to everyone all over the world and yeah it's not going to always be beneficial to everyone because some selections and include exclusions that happen and we think it's personal. I think of Gardner Campbell. <laughs> the unique characteristic that makes an individual. And so thank you for joining this conversation. Um, and thank you for your participation. I really enjoyed reading what you guys have been writing as I spoke and as Suzanne spoke. Um, and so we hope you'll keep, if you have any thoughts about it, just use the same hashtag again. And these are the references. This is, these pictures are all mine, by the way. <laughs> so, and you can email us or tweet to us anytime as well. Thank you. Yeah, ju just uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you everyone for joining. Um, um, so, um, I guess all in all, you know, um, if you're interested, um, if you're interested in learning more about like blogging during the dissertation phase, uh, please feel free to email me. I blogged. Um, I had two blogs for my dissertation. One was for private, just for my committee, um, and one was public. So um, I guess I could have talked about that. <laughs> it never occurred to me. You know, it didn't occur to me that, you know. Um, yeah, anyway, so, but yeah, if you're interested, please email me. I know we've gone past, well, it's actually 2 o'clock now in my, like, my computer says it's 2 o'clock, uh, but we still five minutes late, so if anyone else has, has a question, please feel free to, we still have a few minutes, if, if that's okay with you, Suzanne and Maha, we, still, we, can, we can still answer a question in the last five minutes or so. It occurs to me we had a 100% female audience, am I right? Unless I don't understand everyone's names. So that's also very interesting. Oh, Jen, okay, Jen. Janesh. <laughs> Janesh is <Okay>. the man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, Janesh, please don't go. <laughs> um, okay, it's a few people. Okay, so I can see there's a couple of people typing. So uh, let me see. 
No, I think we think this is. I think everyone's this is it. Anyway, this this has been fantastic. Um, you know, think I I you know part of me wish wishes it, it it was exactly the same thing when we did with with the previous webinar with Chironica that I kind of wish we actually had more time because you get into the conversation and then it's when well, it gets really exciting. But so uh, it's been it's been great. Thanks thanks very much. We'll definitely pick up your you know just continue the conversation in 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 the Go GN with with all our members and and for their field. So definitely um i go back to the same idea if you know if we have any any comments or any um you know any any questions just go for um either tweets or you know using the, the self or your hashtag or just basically get in touch with these guys who these two wonderful women um uh, so again thanks very much everybody for this thanks a round of applause for our um, wonderful speakers, and um, I will be back next. Uh, in, back in, in December, so the next uh, the next webinar will be the first Wednesday in in December. Which I think it's the fourth of December. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but anyway, uh, I'll keep you all posted on that. Um, and again, remember, you know, uh, if anyone wants to, if anyone wants to share your your, your research, you, I mean, this is this is a platform which is, you know, we are ready for, for, for anyone. So, um, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks so, so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Maha. Uh, thank you.